My guest this weekend is a giant in the world of investing. Ray Dalio is the founder and co-chairman of Bridgewater Associates, which with uh, over 40 years has become the largest and best performing hedge fund. Bridgewater manages $160 billion in global assets. Ray is also a best-selling author. His latest book, Principles for Navigating Big Debt Crises, is an innovative look into how policy leaders should think about preventing the next financial crisis. Ray, it's great to have you on the program this weekend. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. And I want to mention that I know your book is available on Amazon, but it is actually free if you want to download it on principles.com, Big Debt Crisis. This is a subject that people usually don't talk about a lot. In fact, even though we have $21 trillion in debt, you're not really hearing worries from the leadership uh, right now. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, and that's normal too, right? I mean, the, the usual way it happens is in bubbles. Everybody's thinking the opposite, and bubbles happen just before busts. I mean, the same thing happens over and over again. Tell me about, I want to look at this historical way you have in terms of debt crisis, but first, let's stay on the global story today. What do you think is most important in terms of driving these markets? And I know these are cycles, they happen over and over again, but once again, we've got worries about growth, we've got worries about trade and tariffs. Your thoughts on what's most important in terms of market direction? Well, uh, of course, this, the cycle where we are in tightening of interest rates, where we are in terms of uh, monetary policy, the pricing of assets, right? So what we had was the, um, let's go back just a moment. We went back in 2008, 2009 financial crisis. What we did is we hit zero interest rates in a debt crisis, much like 1929 to 32, zero interest rates. When you hit zero interest rates, central banks have to print money and buy financial assets. So they bought $15 trillion of financial assets, pushed financial assets up, pushed credit out into the system, and the economy grew, and here we are. Now we're in the late part of the cycle, that later part of the cycle when you have to put on the brakes because unemployment gets lower and so on. It means that they tighten monetary policy. So the tightness of monetary policy. At, together with what we had was a big fiscal stimulation in the form of not only the uh, corporate taxes, but other forms of fiscal stimulation at, when there's a capacity constraint. And so that had the effect. Now, so when we look at what matters, monetary policy matters. Where we are in the economic cycle matters. <clears throat> Geopolitics matters. In other words, populism matters. The left and the right. Populism has more conflict internally and more conflict externally. What also matters is the emergence of China as a competitor on the world scene because that changes the nature. So those are the things that matter. Let me ask you about monetary policy. What's your take in terms of the lag effect it takes to actually have an impact on assets? We've seen the Federal Reserve now raise interest rates three times this year. We're expecting the Fed to continue to tighten. But then also that's that balance sheet that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. The fact that the Fed has to unwind uh, $5 trillion of its, or $4 trillion in this balance sheet. Is that going to constitute a pressure? Do you think, is that another form of tightening? It is, an, it's of course another form. It's the selling of assets. Right. If QE uh, supports assets, reverse QE uh, is a negative for assets. So the, they'll, the pace at which they'll do that will be very important. Uh, I personally don't believe that they can do much more of the tightening because they've raised the short-term interest rates up to equal the same as long-term interest rates all along the curve. So basically you can get 3% anywhere in the curve and you can put your money in cash and not worry about price movements at, and get 3%. Now when you look at the returns of equities, expected returns of equities from these prices, it's not going to be that much more than 3%. It has more risk in it. You, you just said you don't think that the Fed is going to be able to tighten much more. Are you saying that you don't think the Fed's going to be raising rates consistently next year? No, I don't think the Fed will be consistently raising rates next year. What do you think? I think that, uh, I think that what's in the curve, I think if they continue to raise rates faster than is built into the curve, that that will affect all asset prices because all asset prices have that one interest rate. You know, an asset um, is the purchase. Uh, 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 it, it's the present value of a cash flow. 
when you buy an asset, you pay a lump sum payment for future cash flows, and there's a discount rate. That interest rate affects all assets. So stocks compete with bonds, with compete with cash, which competes with real estate and private equity, and all of those. You raise the interest rate faster than is built into the existing expectation in the curve, and that has a negative effect on asset prices. That negative effect on asset prices also tightens credit. It means then it puts the brakes on the economy. And now we have a delicate situation. We're going to go into the next presidential election. That's why uh, there's a, a delicate situation sure. with monetary policy being there. And we have then, as a backdrop to that, we have a de delicate political situation because of the populism. In addition, the Federal Reserve and other central banks' capacity to stimulate is less. So if the economy goes down, you'll have political implications, you'll have social implications because the rich and the poor, uh, the left and the right will be more challenged, and you're going to have um, an issue of whether monetary policy is going to be effective. So it's not, this is not a widely held view that the Federal Reserve is not going to be able to raise rates as much as some people thought next year. It's not a widely held view. That's what makes a market. Yeah, you know? you're right. But but th I, I think if people start recognizing that they're going to have a barrier to continue this rate rising environment, um, I, I would imagine that's going to be a big upside surprise. Well, I think that's what we saw this weekend. I think you saw a bit of a realization of that by um, in the comment by Powell. J Jay Powell, yeah. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, you saw a shift, and you saw the markets react to that shift. That shift was, oh, we're getting very close to the neutral rate, okay? That tone has changed relative to what it was not long before that. 